Five Nights at Freddy's is a story that I've been following for several years now, because I think it's a really compelling story. What have we done? It follows a man and his journey into darkness, how he took innocent lives in a place that should have brought them joy, and how even after his death... There's no going back now. He left a legacy of darkness and corruption, and how people try to grapple with that, and hopefully make something new even after what he's left for them to put back together. Face the consequences. His awful legacy infested the lives of his old family, his old friends, and everyone he ever met. And the souls of those he killed now infest the hearts of the robotic entertainers at what should just be a regular Chuck E. Cheese pizzeria. The story runs deep and there's so many different facets to it that we could talk about it for ages and still not get to every detail of the story, considering it's been going on for almost a decade now. If you've been on the internet recently, you're probably at least somewhat familiar with the story, or at least the gist of it. You know, it talks about haunted robots and a serial killer, and how he even causes many problems after his own death as he comes back to life as a sort of zombie, rabbit, serial killer thing, which is a little weird, but it's kind of cool, isn't it? The story spans several decades and several games, way too many books, and just... Just so unbelievably many characters. I mean, there are so many characters in this thing, it's it's just, it's not even funny. I, I don't know how they got away with this. And most people just kind of want to talk about the story of the thing, which makes sense because there's a lot to it. There's so much to talk about in terms of the story of this series. I have even talked way too much about it in the past. I mean, did you see this video? Did you see how long this video is? I'm going mad. But before we talk about that, today I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about... A different story. It's not the story of the series, it's the story behind it. And I want to talk about how I feel like this series has grown into something different from when it began, and how I don't think anyone really understands what it's becoming, and how it's driving us all slowly to the brink of madness. I am afraid of what Five Nights at Freddy's has become. I know this video is pretty long and it's a bit of a time commitment, so before we get into the real meat and potatoes of things, let me just give you a bit of a preview on what we're going to be talking about. Are you interested in fish-rabbit hybrids that swim around and can also replace your body and make an exact clone of it? No? Well, what about the idea of all of humanity slowly dying of cancer and being replaced by babies made of jello or something of the like? What about computer chips that can warp and twist the world around you until it's nearly entirely unrecognizable, forcing you into a world of your own delusions? What about pink slime that can suck up your body and replace it with an exact clone? Oh, not really your cup of tea? Okay. How about some more cloning plots? Because there is a suspicious number of cloning plots in this series where characters get replaced and there's just like at least a dozen of these and I don't know what to make of it and there's just way too many clones in this series. It's, it's really weird. Okay, none of these suit your fancy. In fact, they all sound kind of insane. Well, what about male pregnancy? A man gives birth to a rabbit and all of this is from... FNAF has managed to captivate people around the world in many ways, both by being incredibly simple and incredibly complex at the same time. The gameplay is interesting enough, being simple, but also well-crafted, and it works quite well with minimal mechanics. In the first game, it's really just cameras, lights, and doors, and that's all you need to create engaging gameplay. And in a different game, maybe people would have wanted more, but in this game, that's okay, because that isn't even the main reason people come to the series. People come to it for the story, of course. And if I'm judging from the views that MatPat gets on every single video he makes on this game series, people really want to hear more about the story, and they also really don't want to solve it themselves, they kind of want someone else to solve it for them, which, I mean, fair enough. But it's weird, isn't it? Because the story is incredibly cryptic, and actually not much is told outright to you. At least, at the start, it wasn't. Now, more recently, things have been started to get, you know, told to the audience much more clearly and concisely, whether people like that or not. Vanny. It is very similar to Vanessa, and also Bunny. That cannot be a coincidence. But in the beginning especially, things were very vague. But that's sort of the charm. It's a puzzle, a puzzle to be solved by this giant community. And yet even with all the massive amounts of people we have just very interested in this thing, we still are very confused about many aspects of the story because it's just so strange and mysterious. So even before the series went completely insane and digital computer virus ghosts were a thing, it was really interesting and really fun. And 
all of this is kind of just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what makes this series so odd, interesting, and frightening. See, it isn't the games, or the books, or the terrifying imagery, or the horrible secrets lying in the story of this series that really terrify me. It's something much darker. And what keeps me up at night isn't Freddy Fazbear himself, it's the chilling idea that maybe no one really knows what this series is about. And I don't think there's a single person alive who knows what this series has done to people and what it's done to me. Maybe this series has driven people to a unique form of madness that I haven't seen anywhere else and I don't think we really can comprehend. And all of this is why I'm making this video. We have a lot to talk about. I remember how I first stumbled across this series. Back then, I, I had no idea that I was going to be, you know, writing a script for this video in a very dark room, recording it in a very claustrophobic small room, or draining my life away editing it for the world to see later. I was just a kid, I didn't know anything, and now I know too much. It was 2015, around the time of FNAF 4, one year after the first FNAF game, and I was swinging in my backyard on a little swing set, and the neighbor kid, he was explaining to me uh, sort of the lore of the series, only, you know, even though it wasn't nearly as complicated back then, he didn't really understand it, and looking back now, what he tried to explain it to me as was very wrong, but also very entertaining. Which is funny, because it did terrify me back then, even though it was very wrong, and not at all what the series really is. I also believe it was an early red flag of the mania that this series would bring people for years to come. So, the story I was told went basically like this. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza is a children's pizzeria, obviously, which stars various animatronic characters, very similar to Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, the characters are Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Walrus. He doesn't have a name, he's just Walrus, and I don't know if this is from like a fan game or something, or if it just doesn't exist and, and, and the neighbor kid I was talking to just made this up. But there's a Walrus, I guess. Cool, I love it. <laughs> Regardless, FNAF is very scary because it involves you crawling through the vents of this pizzeria trying to escape from these animatronics who, if they catch you, will lift you up into the sky using a force beam from their stomach and drain out your soul, leaving you an empty husk and them with one more soul to add to their collection. What's their goal to have with all these souls? I, I don't know, I don't know why they're collecting souls. Um, but that was the story I was told. Uh, I realize some people watching this video maybe have not played FNAF and know very little about it. Um, I want you to know that this is exactly accurate, and this is the exact story of the series. None of this is wrong, it's completely accurate. So I was kind of hooked, and while for the next few years I would sort of regain and lose interest over and over again and slowly dip out of the series several times, what I ended up with was this obsession uh, with it. And even though at first I couldn't watch a Let's Play of it because I was just too scared. No, no, no! No! And I had to be very careful that I didn't get jump scared through the video because it would just, it would just, it would be terrifying and I would be up all night about it. I would just continue to have that interest in it and it would sort of compound over time. I think the point where I really had my full interest in the series was around when Pizzeria Simulator came out. That was when the, the horrifying fear of the series kind of subsided and I was able to actually enjoy it and really get into the story of it without absolutely pissing myself. Also, the reason you can't see my legs right now is because I have pissed myself already while recording this video out of sheer fear. Freddy Fazbear's a scary guy. I just, I can't, I can't help it. I'm pissing myself all day long, every time I think about him. But you know, I was a man now and I wasn't nearly as scared of these old animatronics. I eventually actually made a YouTube channel, um, which at first was sort of centered around a few Minecraft videos, um, a game that I'm very good at. That's real bad. Yep, okay, um, let's, let's, let's just, yeah, I don't see this going anywhere good. Okay, there we go. But slowly started to shift to Five Nights at Freddy's. And I slowly started to create videos on the topic, and as I was doing so, branch out in my own understanding. And slowly, I came to a deeper realization of what this series is. That is how I eventually descended into this deep, dark pit of despair that I have yet to escape from. 
we have a lot to talk about. By now I know more about the series, I know more about the actual story. I know that the animatronics are possessed by children's souls, I know about William Afton and how he was killed by them, ended up in a springlock suit that he's now trapped inside as this weird zombie rabbit thing we mentioned earlier, and how he's coming back for revenge, trying to gain immortality as his old friends and family try to tear him down and make an end of this cursed history. So the question is like, who comes up with this stuff? Because we haven't even gotten to the really insane stuff yet, we've just kind of covered the basics, and I'm wondering what kind of guy comes up with this type of thing? I mean, it must be a very, very evil man. Or a devout Christian named Scott Cawthon, whose previous work included Bible animations and a movie based on the Pilgrim's Progress, which is a Christian sort of book that's like an allegory for the Christian life, and, and this is the guy who made Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> yeah, all of his previous work is basically animations and games, which a lot of them are sort of more normal games. The Desolate Hope is really good if you haven't played it. It's, it's quite good, and it has some hints at his future work. I really enjoy it. He also made a game called Fart Hotel, and that's not important for the video, but I really wanted to mention Fart Hotel. But a lot of his work includes, like, good morals for children and values that they should learn, and it's all really wholesome. And then a couple of years later, he's moving on to child murder, and my question is just, like, look, what happened? Is he okay? Should we be worried? Does someone- maybe someone needs to talk to him. You know, the thing about Scott is that even after all these years, we don't know too much about the guy. I mean, we know about his previous work, and we know a little bit about his life, but, like, he's a very private man, and, and that's perfectly fine. I'm not saying that we should know more about him, but I think it's interesting that for someone who's such a big figure on the internet, he's remained relatively private, and that's pretty cool. I didn't think that was possible anymore on the internet. Of course, there was that one time where we did find out more about him, and we found out that he had donated several thousand dollars to Donald Trump, and then people started threatening his life and the life of his family, and... I hate the internet because it's really not a great place. Um, I hope he's doing well now because that's that's pretty terrible. <laughs> I mean, when Scott started making these games, it was kind of his last ditch attempt at making a video game because all the ones he'd made before, and they were a lot, had really been unsuccessful. And they hadn't done very well, and in fact, some people were really getting very angry at him about his mediocre games, even though I think a lot of them are pretty alright. And he was really down in the dumps, and he couldn't keep this up. He was making these huge elaborate games like The Desolate Hope, and it just wasn't paying off. All the time he spent making them didn't go too much, and he couldn't really afford to help his family with them. So, Five Nights at Freddy's was his last attempt to make something that people would really enjoy. And what's interesting is it was made from his greatest failure. I won't dwell on it for too long because I feel like a lot of you already probably know the story, but Five Nights at Freddy's was originally based on a game called Chipper and Sons Lumber Co., also by Scott Cawthon, and that game was criticized for having really unnerving animatronic designs. Actually, I should clarify that these weren't even supposed to be animatronics, but they were criticized for looking like animatronics. Scott intended for this to be a friendly game about beavers, and all people saw was terrifying robotic movements. And Scott was really down in the dumps over this for a while, he was like, well, I wanted them to be cute if they're horrifying, that that must mean I really missed the mark. But then he was like, okay, well, screw you, I'm gonna make them even worse. And then he did, and he made Five Nights at Freddy's, and now all the animatronic designs are terrifying, until they weren't, um, and it's become this worldwide phenomenon, which is honestly a very inspiring story. And I think it's really cool how he was able to take criticism that almost crushed him, and instead turn it into something that allowed him to better his craft and create this empire. He did this by capitalizing on the success of the first game, and he made several more games in quick succession which, while very similar to each other, also allowed him to create this huge business he's made off of Five Nights at Freddy's. If it was just the one game, or even just another one that maybe took a little longer to make, I think people would have forgotten about it. I think it would have just been another internet fad that kind of died off eventually, like Slender. But he made sure to really capitalize on things and make several more games immediately, and that allowed FNAF to have some real staying power. I mean, you could expect for a while, every few months, to see a new FNAF game, and that was something that allowed it to stay in people's minds for a very long time. And the story gripped people by the fastballs. All Scott had to do to continue this and make it even better was just keep making games. And he did, with the next entry in the series, Five Nights at Freddy's Sister Location. After the first four entries that were all relatively similar and just expanded on the lore and the gameplay, uh, he made this game, which was a big departure. Wait, no, we've, we've forgotten something. Uh, back up a bit. All Scott had to do to continue this and make it even better was just keep making games. But he didn't. 
Instead, he created the product that I believe is the start of the madness we're going to really delve into later in this video. He created FNAF World. FNAF World is an RPG released after FNAF 4 that made a lot of people upset. It was made because Scott was just really tired of making such dark games and it was really taking a toll on him. He wasn't used to it, remember. He had made a lot more bright stuff before this. But the reason people didn't like it was only partially because of the tone it was going for that was so different from what we were used to. It was also because the game was just kind of unfinished, and it was cluttered, and it was kind of messy, and if you look at the battle sequences, there's just so much going on. I mean, look at... Look at all of this! What is that attack? What is that attack? This is, these are all attacks going on at once, and it's all very confusing, and, and it's, it was overwhelming, and people didn't know what was going on, and I think there were all these attacks that every character could do, and I don't think each one was given an explanation at first. I think that only came in later updates, so you would see this list of attacks that you could do, and you wouldn't know what either of them did. You would kind of have to figure it out, which is hard to do when there's 10 different attacks going on at once, and you don't know what's going on. So people were kind of in the right for not liking this game terribly much, until Scott did improve it drastically. He made it way better, he improved it graphically, he improved it gameplay-wise, and while it's still not a perfect game, he's now put it up for free on GameJolt, and you can just go and download it, and people are still are mad about this game, and I don't understand it. But the reason this game was made was important, and I think it's very good that we got it. Because yeah, Scott was kind of in a dark place again because he'd been making such sad stories. And I don't think that he was really able to do it without a break after FNAF 4, which was probably the darkest out of all of them in terms of just character designs. I mean, look at these things. These are just, they are the definition of evil and scary and bad. He couldn't have continued this for very long without taking some kind of a break. But I don't think he also wanted to stop making games because he figured people would leave him behind if he did. So he figured he had to make something, and he made FNAF World. But after FNAF World, he continued once more. He made Sister Location, which introduced much more complex gameplay and a more direct story. I mean, it had voice acting now, which allowed the story to be directly told to you much easier than through Phone Guy and weird cryptic 8-bit minigames. This continued into Pizzeria Simulator, which Pizzeria Simulator was weird. It started as this 8-bit pizzeria simulator, which was pretty simple, but whatever, it's fun. But psych, it's actually a horror game. But psych, it actually is still a pizzeria simulator, and it's not a horror game. But psych, it is a horror game, but there's just pizzeria simulator elements to it, and there's also still many mini-games, and they all hint at the lore, and there's also weird animatronics from the past, and we don't know how they're here, and there's a story going on here, and oh, I guess it's all over? What? What just happened? Pizzeria Simulator was weird, but it's still one of my favorites. It's so crazy, and as an ending to the series, I think it was pretty great. Until it wasn't the ending of the series, but we haven't got to that yet. Just give me time, we'll cover everything. Then Ultimate Custom Night came, which was really kind of a capstone for the series, you know? It was every animatronic, mostly, and then they were all coming at you all at once in this sort of big send-off to the series. But it came back, baby, with a full VR remake of the first three games, plus several different game modes. It's all so fun, there's so much here. It's probably my favorite game in the FNAF series, just because it has so much going on, and I love VR in general. And he hired a whole team to make it. The series was really stepping up. Then he made FNAF AR, and we don't talk about that one. Then he made Security Breach, and we don't talk about that one. And through all of this, whatever it was that infested FNAF World, it remained. It showed itself in Troll Games, which promised to be the next big game in the series, only to be a little lighthearted minigame to troll people. It showed itself in Pizzeria Simulator, which had some regular Pizza Tycoon elements that just kind of seemed like an old Scott game. You know, none of the darkness and just kind of all the fun. There were elements of darkness in that game too, but it was mixed. It was like there was two different perspectives Scott was coming at the game with, and two different games he was creating at once. It manifested itself in Freddy in Space, Freddy in Space 2, Security Breach, Fury's Rage. Freddy in Space being a little mini game where Freddy is in space. This is a horror game series, remember? Um, and Security Breach, Fury's Rage, where you're playing as the characters from Security Breach, and they're in like a, like a beat-em-up game thing, and this is a horror game series, remember? And all of this would kind of just be neat and fun, but there's more to it. Let's back up to FNAF World again. At the end of FNAF World, if you play the game right, there's a boss fight that you can complete. 
And it's not a boss fight against any real character that we've seen before, it's a boss fight against Scott Cawthon. You, you fight the creator of the series and he tells you that it's all your fault, that he's kept making these games over and over and over again, all to satiate this insatiable desire that we have for more. And in real life, Scott has said that this was kind of a joke and it wasn't really serious, but it's, it's weird, isn't it? I mean, what kind of game developer puts themselves as a, as a boss fight in their own game, cursing the player for everything that they are? I mean, it's so peculiar. At the end, you literally murder Scott Cawthon and he tells you that you've ended the story by ending the storyteller. Alternatively, you can also end the game by killing Chipper, who, if you'll remember, was one of the characters from one of Scott's old games and the one that was criticized so brutally that it cost him to create this new game series in the first place and kickstart this entire thing. Chipper curses you and he says that he will return and that Freddy Fazbear isn't the one who will be grinding his teeth on your bones? It'll be Chipper? Who is also now like a robot thing? What is going on? <laughs> and tons of this like goofy stuff happens in these games and it's all really fun and I love it. It's part of the reason I love this series but when I look at that blank blue head of Scott's avatar, I, I'm i scared of what it might be coming up with next. And I realize it probably sounds like I'm being dramatic. I understand that this really isn't as crazy as I'm making it out to be. Yes. But it's interesting, right? Scott just wants to make games. And I feel like over time, we've all sort of grown to like the lighthearted stuff that he does more. You know, I think over time, we've grown to really appreciate the more fun stuff he does. And that's why he's done more of it. And you know, I wonder if, if he came out with a children's game or even just a more lighthearted game in general now, I think people would really like it. I think people would really appreciate it. I think they would play it and, and love it and it doesn't matter if it's not connected to FNAF at all. In fact, I think it would be really cool if it wasn't. I think it would be really popular and people would really enjoy it. But I don't think he will. Um, Scott's retired now after the death threats that I mentioned previously from horrible people on Twitter.com. It seems like he's retired and he's just going to be focusing on his family from now on, which, you know, that's kind of the lesson of those Fast and Furious movies that I've never watched. Family is the most important thing. And I'm happy for him. While he was making games, he was able to tell this complete and satisfying story, one that didn't devolve into lunacy and complete insanity, and one that was completely normal in every sense of the word. I want to make it very clear before we go into the next part of this video that I don't hate the series. I'm realizing now it may seem like that's what I'm saying. Uh, it's not. I really like the series and we're talking about some of the more interesting aspects of it. And so I realize that it may sound like I'm being overly critical of it because of that. But I just, I, I love all of this. And to illustrate that and to illustrate how much I do love this series, I want to talk about one of my favorite aspects of it. The books, which a lot of you seem to be fairly unfamiliar with, even if you love the series. So if you know very little about the books, you're about to find out a lot more about them. This also happens to be one of the most insane aspects of the series, so this should be fun. So as I mentioned previously, the gameplay of this series is what really keeps people engaged. Except it's not, because it's totally not. People are really interested in the story, and that's the main thing of the series, and anything else is just supplementing that. Again, have you seen, like, the sheer amount of views that those MatPad videos get? It's insane. I'd like a piece of that pie, please. Can I have some more, some more views for this video, maybe? Share it with your friends, I don't know. I guess this is the part of the video where I where I advertise stuff. Um, check out the Patreon page if you like this video. I YouTube doesn't pay me, so you know, a dollar or two on Patreon, like that'd be pretty cool. Your name will be at like the end of these videos, which you could probably appreciate, I think. I hope. You'll get to see videos early. That's cool, right? Uh, also this is a Discord server um for the channel. Feel free to check that out. Um anyway, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, the story. I mean, from the first game, even when it was very simple, people latched onto the story. The problem was, it was kind of hard to tell the story through the games in the way that Scott wanted to tell it, and I don't think that the vagueness of it was really intentional. I think it was just a part of the medium. It was being told in a small game, and so of course the story was going to be pretty vague too. So, how do you fix that? Well, you make 
books, and you make tons of books. I mean, there are more books than games now at this point. There's dozens of them, and they honestly maybe sell better than the games at this point. See, it was a slow process at first. The first book that we got was The Silver Eyes, which, judging from the most popular video on my channel, many of you are probably familiar with that story. It's pretty simple, maybe it means a bit too much on the characterization of characters who just vanish in the next few books, but it was pretty good. I think it was a great adaptation of the source material, and I think it worked really well. It also gave us some answers to questions that we had for a really long time. I mean, it told us who William Afton was. That's crazy. Then it got a sequel, and the sequel was interesting. See, things started to get a bit weird. While the first book was a fairly standard story about grief and loss and how we confront one's own past, this new novel took a different direction. It introduced some unique elements. Now, there's killer animatronics roaming the town under the dead of night and burying themselves during the day, chasing after our protagonist for some reason. Only, they can also disguise themselves as normal, friendly-looking animatronics and even, like, realistic-looking biological creatures using discs in the robots that will emit a high-pitched frequency that tricks your mind into thinking you're seeing something you're not using brain waves? <laughs> so those were some weird concepts, but like, FNAF was getting to be more sci-fi. I mean, this was around the time of Sister Location, and Sister Location also had a ton of sci-fi elements, so this isn't that surprising. But then the final book came out, and this is where things get very weird. So the fourth closet is the final book. Um, it's the third book, which is weird because it's called The Fourth Closet, and that book comes with some weird revelations. Mainly the fact that the protagonist we've been following this whole time, who is a teenage girl named Charlie, was actually a robot this whole time. Keep in mind, we've seen her eat, and sleep, and bleed, and turns out she was actually, um, just not human, and she's just an elaborate robot, and nobody knew except her father, who created her because his real daughter died, and so in his grief, he made several robotic daughters. He made four of them. There was the first, which was a baby, the second, which was a toddler, then there was this one, who is teenager, and then the fourth one, who is a grown woman, and that's why the fourth closet, because they were in closets, and the fourth closet was empty because the grown woman also became Circus Baby from Five Nights at Friday's sister location, but she's hot now, and that's a little concerning, and the characters in the book certainly know it because they definitely address her smoking <sighs> um it's it's a little weird um but the thing is it was kind of hinted at the whole time i mean in the first book the silver eyes it's mentioned and i mentioned this so many times in this channel because i think it's really weird there were tripod marks on the ground outside charlie's house and in the third book it's mentioned that her memories were created with a tripod because she's a robot she doesn't have actual memories so from the very first book it's been known to the authors that she was a robot the whole time they didn't just come up with this in the last moment this was something that was planned from the very beginning in the second book as well william afton is accused of faking his death because fake blood was found where he died but the fake blood Turns out, wasn't actually his, it was Charlie's, and he knows that because he says, yeah, I didn't use any fake blood, I don't know whose that was, but it sure wasn't me, and that's weird because, again, that hints at the fact that this was just a plot point that was planned from the very beginning. So, she was a robot, Charlie was a robot, and I'm just gonna sit here for 10 seconds to let you really, just, just let that information sink in. Okay, actually 10 seconds is a really long time to be silent. Um, most of you would probably click off the video if I was silent for 10 seconds because attention spans have gotten really, really small thanks to stuff like TikTok and YouTube shorts, which is a thing, I guess. And so that's kind of an issue and I'm not gonna be silent for that long because we need to hurry things along or all of you are just gonna leave. Please don't leave. I'm, I'm lonely. The weirdest thing is that this didn't really affect the games that much. The games, still stayed relatively grounded. I mean, as I mentioned, Sister Location brought in a lot more sci-fi concepts, but they were still not insane, like this was. It's weird, right? Because it was like the games in the books were just entirely different things that didn't really interact much at all by this point. I mean, name a single person in the games who is a person, but it turns out that they were actually a robot the whole time. Oh, are you kidding me? This is happening again? So you can't even escape it if you're just playing the games. I mean, first it was with Michael Afton, who technically isn't a robot, but he's a human who is having a robot crawl around inside him. And also, people are now saying that the new protagonist of the series, Gregory, is a robot. But it's okay, because that was the end of the book trilogy. It was the final one, and that was the end of the insane concepts that were introduced, and that really made this series 
a little stranger. The end of the books. They were, all things considered, pretty good, pretty entertaining, and uh, maybe a little insane, but whatever. They were fun. And there shouldn't be any more books introduced to introduce more completely off-the-wall, batshit crazy, insane concepts. Fazbear Frights is the second book series in the Five Nights at Freddy's universe. It features three short stories in each book, kind of similar to Goosebumps in their sort of short story nature, and also a little epilogue at the end of each book that teases at a greater story that's being told across all of them. These stories are really fun, and some of them are actually quite scary and done really well, and they've gotten better over time. But some of the ideas in this series are a little bizarre, some of them so much so that I'm not quite sure how they came up with these ideas to begin with. Let me offer some examples, starting with some fairly simple ones. Ones that wouldn't feel all that out of place in a Goosebumps novel if you just replace the FNAF characters with other ones. I don't know, I've, I've never read Goosebumps. And this is one of my favorite stories in the original Fazbear Friday series, Room for One More. It's one of the shorter ones, but I quite like it. Room for One More follows a man named Stanley who works at a secret and sort of sketchy underground facility. His employer barely speaks to him, and whenever the two of them do communicate, there's a noticeable nervousness from any other person involved with this facility, and this begs the question, what do they know that Stanley doesn't? But things get more bewildering. Stanley is the night guard here at the facility, just like we'd seen a lot of the FNAF games, but the odd thing is that he's not assigned to keep things out of the place, but rather to make sure everything inside it stays in. That's slightly ominous, but Stanley's never actually had to do much for this job, and has scarcely encountered another human. All in all, the job actually gives him a great opportunity for a nap. <laughs> Only one night after waking up from one of these naps, Stanley encounters an odd little doll. It wasn't there when he was last awake. The doll is sort of cute and even says little phrases, saying it loves Stanley and even wants him to take it home with him. Stanley likes the little doll, so he decides he will. But for the time being, he goes back to sleep. And as he does, he has a strange nightmare where he watches his girlfriend date another man as he eats spaghetti made of worms. Uh, for some reason, he eventually wakes up with a start and after seeing the doll from earlier gone, leaves work feeling disoriented. In the coming days, Stanley starts to feel sick. His arm is sore and swollen, and his throat is scratchy. Still, after a family event in the past, he's grown to have a distrust of doctors, so he just goes into work like normal, ignoring his illness. Tonight, he finds another little doll, which disappears after his next nap, just like the last one. His dreams continue to spiral, now starting to feature FNAF characters, especially ones from a sister location that Stanley has never seen in his life. And each night from now on, these dolls keep appearing, and despite Stanley's growing bewilderment, they keep disappearing while he sleeps. He also grows sicker, becoming more swollen, dizzy, and sick as the burning sensation in his throat continues. Still, he goes into work every night, you know, like a real trooper. One night, he decides to get to the bottom of what's going on with the dolls, even with his worsening condition. So he stays awake and examines the place, but he can't for the life of him figure out what's happening to the dolls. So, feeling completely weary and broken down, he falls asleep again and wakes up to find one of the dolls halfway down his throat pipe, crawling further down by the second. He coughs the thing away and in shock realizes the truth. A sinking feeling of dread grows in his stomach and unfortunately, it isn't the only thing there. Several of the small dolls are crawling around inside Stanley, swelling his limbs and causing the burning inside him. More appear now, dozens of them, making their way inside and crying, isn't there room for just one more? And in defeat, Stanley collapses. This is, in my opinion, Fazbear Fright at its best. The story might get a little predictable at times, but I think it's really enjoyable and pretty scary at times too. It makes me feel genuinely uncomfortable, and for the first five books of Fazbear Fright, this is what we got. Mostly. These first 15 stories weren't all winners. In fact, one of them may be the worst thing ever created by a human being. But otherwise, they were pretty great. But as the series crossed the halfway point, and six more books were announced, things started to get... strange. A strange thing started to happen. The lunacy that had crept its way into several FNAF games and many FNAF books as well started to rear its ugly head once again, and this time, it was here to stay. Stories started to go off the rails much more frequently, with ludicrous concepts that sometimes weren't even just in one story. 
Sometimes, they would show up for several stories on end, hinting that they were actually more important than we thought. Suddenly, we were getting stories that involved pink Fazgu that, if you'll remember from earlier, replaces you as a exact copy and a clone. Suddenly, we were getting stories without any FNAF concept or characters at all. Like the one where the antagonist of this whole story is literally a road sign. Or the one where there's a girl that turns into a pizza. Or maybe the one with the sea bonnies. Bonnie, the animatronic, but he swims around like a little fishy, and also he replaces you with an exact clone by having many, many, many of him, and then they all like sort of form the shape of a human body, and then they replace you, and you die. Now obviously there is still a handful of good stories here, some really good ones, and I can even enjoy the terrible ones in the way that like, it's so bad, it's good. It's just fun to realize how much more sane I am than some people. I'm sane, right? <sighs> but by far, the most ludicrous story in this series is one that I haven't even mentioned yet, but that I sort of alluded to earlier. It's a story called In the Flesh, and it should not exist. In the Flesh follows a man named Matt, who is a video game developer working on the latest VR game for the Five Nights at Freddy's series. And if you think it's weird that this story is mentioning the very series it's a part of and is incredibly meta, you should know that there's another story that did that same thing so much and in such a potentially dangerous way that it was completely cut out of the series entirely. We'll probably talk about that one much later in the video, it's important for separate reasons. But yeah, Matt is developing a new VR game for FNAF, one about Springtrap. It's pretty standard, I guess, but Matt is getting pretty frustrated with it, since it's not working out the way he wants. Actually, Matt is sort of getting frustrated with everything lately, and is generally a awful person. He's probably everyone's least favorite character in the series. I actually like him less than William Afton, which is saying something considering that William is a literal child murderer. Matt makes his and everyone else's lives miserable, and even takes out his constant anger on his own video game until things start to go even worse for the guy. See, Matt starts to grow a belly and the body horror, sort of similarly to the last story we covered, begins. Matt's belly starts to grow, almost as though something is inside it, and it grows even more painful for him each day, until the point where it gets so bad that he resigns himself to cutting himself open to relieve the pain. Matt grabs a knife and begins to cut, and sure enough, there's relief, but there's also the sudden realization that this isn't just a big belly. Matt is... um... <laughs> pregnant, and he has just accelerated the process. I mean, because he's now officially giving birth. A small creature is coming out from him from the incision, and it's not a baby, and as Matt starts to feel queasy, he recognizes the little baby as Springtrap, and finally, as Matt starts to lose consciousness, the baby Springtrap takes his head in its hand and calls him Daddy. I am so sorry for the mental image I just gave you. I, I wish there was some way to spare you from this whole mess, but I, I don't think that there is. Just, it all only gets worse from here on out. So, if you want, leave the video. Just, just go. Just click off. If you stay on this video, things are only going to get worse. Springtrap saying daddy will just be the least of your worries. But if you, for some reason, want to keep watching the video, sicko, I'll continue. I'll continue. I already own the book where Springtrap says daddy, so it's not like I'm escaping this franchise anytime soon. So the Fazbear Fright series has finally gone off the rails, but it was eventually put out of its misery. After 11 books and one bonus book with scrap stories, it was over. It was finished, and it couldn't descend any further into madness. Except they made more! There is a new Fazbear Fright Season 2, basically, called Tales from the Pizzaplex, entirely about Security Breach, with nine more books! And sure, most of these new stories are perfectly fine, and most of them are actually better than Fazbear Frights, but there's still one story where the whole world dies of cancer, and they're all replaced by goo babies made of jello, who drowned the main character in an ocean of... Jello things stuff? And it turns out it was all actually in the Matrix to begin with, so who even cares? Where could this go from here? I'm- I'm sorry, this is unprofessional of me. I'll- I'll try to conduct myself better. It's just, when you've been following this series for as long as I have, you get used to a certain type of story. We'll talk more about it in a bit, but this series is essentially about haunted robots, complicated family relationships, and serial killers. So, to see official products from the franchise delve into such lunacy. It's both funny and, and really terrifying. But the games haven't been affected by it too much, right? I mean, they remain relatively coherent and have told a good and high-quality story, right? 
Let's continue. So there's some people who would say that this series' story has been planned from the very beginning, and I'm not one of those people, I think that idea is kind of crazy, um, because it definitely hasn't. As I mentioned earlier, this game was originally a sort of last-ditch attempt by Scott Coffin to make a game people liked, and if it didn't work, he would just quit. He would just quit and move on to something else. So to think that he had the entire story, including Springtrap pregnancies and Security Breach, all planned out from this first very simple game, that's, that's crazy. That's, that's not true. In fact, it's my personal belief that when Scott was making this series, his goal was to create a scary atmosphere first and an engaging story second. I think he had an idea for the basic story, but nothing involving circus babies, pizza plexes, or, or furry dating anime things. He wanted you to be immersed in the game, but he did want to leave room for expanding upon things if the opportunity presented itself. And after that first game, people were really interested and they did want to know more about the story. The problem was Scott was not that confident in his animation skills. His animations had been seen as pretty lifeless and people didn't like them very much, so he wanted to avoid using them if possible. That's why in the first game, you don't see the animatronics move on cameras. You see them flip between cameras and you only see static as they're moving. The only time you see the animatronics move are if Foxy runs down the hallway and in jump scares. If I remember correctly, I don't think there's anything else. So how do you tell your story and expand upon it without doing that? Well, you use 2D 8-bit cutscenes, I guess. It makes sense for the era these games take place in, and also, it's a cool stylistic choice, and it allows you to make the games faster than if you had done animations to tell your story. There were a few little cutscenes in the second game to sort of, I guess, test the waters, but for the most part, the story here was told in the same way as before, but also with these minigames made in a sort of 8-bit fashion. And using these new 8-bit playable cutscenes, the story was fleshed out. A killer was created now using only a purple sprite for the time being. A puppet was created who would give life to these animatronics and allow these children to still live beyond death. And that was kind of how things went until FNAF 4. FNAF 4 came along and it was weird. All of a sudden we were in a house as a child. Nightmare animatronics, reality bending all around us. So the questions that were raised were, why are we a kid? Why does this take place in a random house? Who are these nightmare animatronics and who made them? And where do they go during the day? And there weren't really any theories that could concretely explain this, except the dream theory. Now, the dream theory is very controversial, even though it was originally suggested by one of the most big FNAF theorists in the world, MatPat. I mean, he honestly probably is the biggest FNAF theorist. And it felt like a cop-out, but the theory did also explain a lot of things. Who are the nightmare animatronics? Well, they're dreams, and they're called nightmare animatronics because they're literally nightmares. Why is this kid having nightmares? Well, because of the accident taken to his brain that we witnessed at the very end of the game. That's what causes him to have these dreams in the first place. Why are objects constantly appearing and disappearing in his home as we play the game? Well, because it's a dream, and so that makes sense. Why else would objects appear and disappear? Why is the same thing happen in FNAF 1, FNAF 2, and FNAF 3? Why do objects appear and disappear at will and move in, in ways that don't really make sense? Huh? That's why. But people went even further. See, this was meant to be the last game in the series, just like later, Pizzeria Simulator was meant to be in the last game in the series, and then Ultimate Custom Night was meant to be the last game in the series, and I also think FNAF 3 was meant to be the last game in the series at some point, but I'm not so sure about that one. But for this one, Scott even made like a whole thank you message and everything, and it seemed like it was all over. But, something happened. Even though the games were over, people were very mad. Not because the games were over, but because of this dream theory. It started to gain some traction. A lot of people didn't like it, but there were a lot of people who did. I mean, it does explain things, and Scott even put out teasers that directly hinted at it. Why is Toy Chica missing her beak in the FNAF 4 minigame was one of the things he said, and it, again, directly led us to that conclusion. What is seen in Shadows is misunderstood in the mind of a child, that can be the same thing. And you look at all these little details from the past few games, and for a while it seemed like the dream theory had some merit to it. As much as we hated it, and as much as it made the ending unsatisfying, it seemed like it made some sense. Until Scott made FNAF 5, and then threw all those fan theories out the window, yeah! Now we had intricate developed characters and new backstories, and it seemed like the dream theory was completely thrown out of the window. After all, why would Scott make more games if we already knew they were all just dreams to begin with? It wouldn't really make much sense. Where would the mystery be if Sister Location was just another dream? And obviously it wasn't. None of these games were dreams. Except they totally were. 
I believe to this day that FNAF 4 was originally meant to say it was all a dream, and that's what Scott intended at the beginning. The thing is, he changed it. He saw that there was such a huge backlash over it, and people hated it so much, and people had gotten really, really invested in this story, and he decided, well, I'm going to change it. I'm going to make another game, even though I said it was done. There's something I need to change here. I mean, again, the Toy Chica beak thing. Like, in the FNAF 4 minigame, Toy Chica's missing her beak, and Scott directly points this out. He's like, that's a little weird, isn't it? Considering in FNAF 2, Toy Chica's also missing her beak, which there should be no correlation between those two things. If he hadn't said anything, I would have just assumed it was just a little reference. You know, in FNAF 4, it was just a reference to FNAF 2 and to what happens in that game. But then he calls it out. That means in the story, there is a meaning behind that happening. To this day, I believe in full confidence that the Dream Theory was originally created by Scott. I don't believe it was his intention in the first three games before that, but I think at some point it was. I mean, as he said in interviews, if people don't like his games, he can't help but change them. That's why he makes new games all the time. He said when he made FNAF 4, it was because people didn't like the jump scare in FNAF 3. When he made FNAF 5, it was because people didn't like the story in FNAF 4. When he made FNAF 6, it was because there were too many loose threads and he wanted an ending. And now, people are suggesting that Gregory, a human child, is a robot, which is, I mean, it's happened before in the series, but not really in the games to this extent. And it's inevitable that we as a community wouldn't be terribly able to handle the mind-breaking madness that's happened in this series for the past few years, but I haven't even talked about the most insane part yet. That's right, there's more! <laughs> I think that at the heart of Scott Cawthon is a little boy who wants to tell stories. If you look at some of his previous work, you'll see some rich worlds and incredible narratives, and I hope that in no part of this video have I come across as bashing that. That's not my intention. I think he's made some really cool stories. I love the absurd things that have happened in this series and the things that might happen when I'm reading Fast Bear Frights or Tales from the Pizza Plex or playing the latest game, I mean, if it weren't for those types of stories, I probably would have lost interest about 40 short stories ago. All of this being said, I I'm still concerned, not about the story being told, but about the fans. And the reason for that is because of the incident I'm about to describe to you. I used to frequently browse Reddit on the subreddit for this series, and there'd often be these types of posts. An image, teaser, or screenshot posted by a fan, and often they'd be convinced that they had just found something new and shocking. Take this image, for example, this is from a real post made on Reddit, and it's posted by a fan, and they're very amazed because they just found a detail that no one else has found. And at first it looks like a pretty standard teaser for the new DLC for the newest game, and nothing too crazy about it. This fan was convinced they had found something, because if you brighten up the image, and you look at the back of this girl's head, do you see the secret hidden face on the back of her head right there? Do you see it? This, the face, the secret face, on the back of her skull. Now, as you know, the color gray in this series often symbolizes uh, dead, being dead, being a ghost. Now, this girl is mostly gray, except that she has blonde hair and a lot of parts of her aren't gray because that's just how image coloring works. But what this clearly means, if we're using it along with this face that's here, is it means that this girl is actually the ghost of Susie who possesses the animatronic Chica in Five Nights at Freddy's. But with the fact that the gray face is on the back of her head, we can assume this means that she is actually backwards in some way, or deceiving us to some extent. In fact, she's mostly gray except for her shoes, which symbolize that she's running from something, possibly William Afton. In fact, there's a lot of greens and purples in the image, which probably means she is running from Springtrap, or Glitchtrap, as he's known now, that he is a rogue computer virus ghost thing. Except that's all obviously ludicrous. There's no face here. These colors don't mean something just because they exist in the image, and the main source of light in the room is her flashlight, which is facing away from her and isn't reaching the back of her, so obviously the back of her is going to have less color because that's just how lighting works. People continue to, not just for this image, but for tons of teasers and nearly every image associated with the series to hyper-analyze it and look for any scrap of detail that can solve the series in some way, shape, or form. And this is not normal. I mean, this is not a normal thing to happen here. I have seen Google documents that are 
dozens of pages long and they just keep going about the story of this series because we are all obsessed with it and that's probably not normal, right? I mean, look at this video script, look at how long this video is going. This is insane. And to demonstrate this even further, I am forced to go back to the books again. There is a book in Fazbear Frights that is actually not officially released as the other books have been. It only exists in a sort of bonus book that was released as a sort of extra for the full box set of every Fazbear Frights book. And that's pretty cool. But the reason it was never officially released is because there were problems with each story. Frankly, for most of them, I don't know what problem it could be. I think most of the stories are perfectly entertaining and fine. But there's one story, The Scoop, which after being released in this bonus book that only a few people even saw, made its way into a Game Theory video. It led to several people being ruthlessly doxxed and harassed, and to be fair to Scott and others, they did not intend for this story to be a part of the main series. They made it very clear it was a bonus thing, an extra thing, but immediately, upon its release, the theory started coming. See, the story's about a girl who is very obsessed with the Five Nights at Freddy's games. It's very meta, as I mentioned before. And she really likes the Five Nights at Freddy's games, but she's looking for something that no one else has found in them. Sound familiar? So she's looking, and she's analyzing, and she's going through FNAF 3 specifically, when she comes across an image no one has seen before of a building. Now, she finds this building, and inside she finds an actual dead child, sort of hinting at the fact that maybe the Finance of Freddy's games are based on a real story, something that no one has uncovered, and the corpses of children who have never been discovered and are just lying in the back of this abandoned building. And this all raises the question of how much these games' stories have been real and how much they've been fake. Obviously, this is all just a part of the short story, and while it's very meta, it's not real. We're not saying that the actual FNAF story is based on a real story or that there's actual dead children. The story, in fact, assures the reader that this was all a big mis misunderstanding and we should not go hunt down real-world businesses to try to solve a video game murder mystery. We should not be performing our own little mystery scavenger hunts based on what video games and books tell us. So guess what the FNAF community did? They hunted down real-world businesses and they performed their own irresponsible mystery scavenger hunt based on the story of silly video games and books. It didn't help that MatPat actually helped them along and told them what he believed to be the location of where this business would exist if it was in real life. Remember, the character in the story found a business from a photograph and she went there and she found the missing child dead in the back of the business. And now, MatPat went and said, oh, if this story was real, I bet this is where the building would be. It'd be somewhere around here. And now, guess what the FNAF community goes and does? I believe this illustrates very well how much we as a community have hungered for secrets and for knowledge, for excitement from every aspect that this series offers. And I'm positive it's been to our detriment. Add to all this the fact that almost every detail in FNAF story has been told in extremely vague ways, and it leaves a lot of room for interpretation and confusion. I don't think that's bad. I don't think that makes the series bad, but I think it means we should be more careful than we have been, especially when there's so many kids who like this series, who are very impressionable and can get the wrong idea very easily. Again, the Google thing. There are children swapping around their little fan theories, which get into extreme elaborate detail, like it's candy on the playground. But like, it is kind of fun to speculate, isn't it? Like, the fact that we don't know many concrete dates for the series means we have to piece together a timeline ourselves, and then the fact that some of the big reveals have been in the children's activity book. I mean, things have been revealed in strange ways, but that kind of makes it more fun. It just creates this as a problem. I've seen arguments break out over whether Springtrap is actually William Afton, or is in fact his son, Michael Afton, even though that makes no sense and should be like the least contested piece of information. I don't know, man. I've seen entire friendships end over arguments about the names of these stupid gray sprites. Hello. I am recording this on the day that I wished for this video to come out. As I'm sure you can understand, I am rushed for time. I do not know where in the video this will go, but it is important that what I am about to say gets said. I realize that I have forgotten to talk about the FNAF fan games, which is bad because they are a very important part of the fan base and the franchise as a whole. There are very many fan games in the series, like more than you would expect, which is really just a testament to how creative the fan base is, and it's really cool. And it shows that not only has this series impacted the internet, but the internet has impacted this series as well. In fact, the creator of the series, Scott Coffin, has actually personally financed some fan games so that they can become actual IPs themselves. Here are some of the fan games that I think are worth mentioning so that they do not go unnoticed. First, the game where Freddy is replaced by cats. The game where Freddy is replaced by a weasel. The game where Freddy is replaced by a talking egg. The game where Freddy is replaced by Wario from Super Mario Bros. The game where Freddy is replaced by Mickey Mouse. 
And finally, the game where Freddy is replaced by well-endowed anime women. And I just realized I don't want to talk about the FNAF fan games anymore. I think we should go back to the main video now. <coughs> but this isn't even talking about how we've affected other fan bases. I mean, in FNAF's wake, there have been several other series that have started to adopt the name of mascot horror. What that means is they're taking on this idea of children's entertainment that has been corrupted and is creating horrible things. I mean, that was something like as far back as the 80s even, and probably even before that. You know, you look at something like 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 Chucky, you know? He was a classic character, and he was kind of the same thing. But now, in video games, it's becoming very common, and a lot of series that weren't even really that to begin with have slowly pivoted to become mascot horror. A lot of people like to rag on Poppy Playtime because it's done this, but I think it's done it fairly well. It's a more linear story, but it's kind of in the same vein. Benji and the Ink Machine as well has also taken off a lot of inspiration from FNAF, even though it also has its own aesthetic and its own thing that it's going for. That being said, a lot of games in the mascot horror space have slowly started to descend into something more vapid, something more empty and, and soulless. One of the most obvious examples I can think of for this and how it's been a detriment to video games is Hello Neighbor. It's technically a mascot horror game, but it's in the same category nonetheless of horror directed towards children. At least, that's what it's become. I remember when Hello Neighbor first sort of showed up in the public consciousness, and its whole thing was it was a neat little puzzle game where the main antagonist, the neighbor, is an AI that learns from your decisions. He learns from the mistakes you make, and the choices you make, and the path you take, and he uses it to change in future runs of the game to actually make it more difficult because he knows what you're going to do next. And that's really cool. It wasn't really scary. I mean, this guy, I don't think he would hurt a fly. He, he doesn't look that menacing to begin with. But then it was an interesting concept. And so who cares? It's fun. But then things continued. And after FNAF started to gain even more traction than it already had, Hello Neighbor started to change. And while the game hadn't officially come out yet at that point, it was in alphas and betas and... and and gammas and sigmas and, and <laughs> it started to change and the focus started to turn away from that whole AI thing which was interesting and the machine learning from your paths and the choices you make and started to pivot more towards the lore and at first it was a couple simple things you know little teasers here at what's going on and hints at this greater story but eventually it started to take over the whole thing and the gameplay started to really suffer and the game came out and it wasn't that great and this happened especially after a certain YouTube channel started to cover the game and talk about the story and all of a sudden flocks of of especially young fans started to flock to the Hello Neighbor series and the developer's tiny build realized this was something they had to hold on to. And so they did it even more. To this day, most people believe that Hello Neighbor was at its best during its alpha days. And nowadays, most people don't really care about the series. And in fact, the developers have started to try and cry out to MatPat on Twitter, please talk about our game again, please. We would like that, please. And more games still started to come out in the Hello Neighbor franchise and many weird ones, but only recently have we actually gotten the Hello Neighbor 2. And it's about what you'd expect. The interesting gameplay has been completely abandoned and the game can be completed in a matter of hours. It's also very broken and the story is even more ludicrous than ever. And when you get to the credits, one interesting thing you might notice is that the people who are involved with this game are Steel Wool Studios, most popular for creating Five Nights at Freddy's VR Help Wanted and the more recent Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach. Obviously FNAF is far more put together than Hello Neighbor, but I find it interesting how these two IPs are more connected than we might think. Of course, now that I mentioned Steel Wool, you've probably noticed, hey, we haven't actually talked about Security Breach that much in this video yet, and that's because we're going to. But first, I need to cover one other thing. Garson of Ban Ban is about a kindergarten class with several wacky and crazy characters who I think are supposed to be animatronics, even though they really don't look like it. But uh-oh, things have gone wrong. The mascots of this place aren't as they seem, and they're gonna get you. Like, this green thing, or this red thing, or this bird thing, and none of them really look like much of anything at all. Look at how scary they are! Aren't you frightened? Aren't you? The game has a link to the merch page on its main menu before you even play the game, which, fair enough, I guess, it's free after all, the game, so I guess they may as well plug their merch. But as you walk through the empty halls of this game setting, you start to notice some strange things. Little notes that read like an adult trying to pass themselves off as a small child. Layouts and structural details that just don't make much sense. Creatures watching you in a surprisingly chilling way, not because of their appearance necessarily, but because of that cold, dead stare that they give off. And the idea that maybe we weren't meant to get this far. Maybe we should have stopped while we were ahead and, and you start to ask yourself, I mean, how did we get here? 
how did we get to this place? The animatronics here aren't frightening. I mean, I don't even know if they're supposed to be animatronics. They just make me sad. Look at this guy. He's a bird. He just squawks when he jump scares you. I don't understand how that's scary. We can take a look at the recent analog horror trend as well, which I think is way better done. There's a lot of analog horror and a lot of it's pretty garbage as well, but there's some really great creations that have come out of it. This is kind of based on the security camera aesthetic of Final Fantasy Freddy's, although it's obviously based on a lot of other things as well. In fact, some of the first analog horror stuff was FNAF VHS tapes, and now it's expanded into Baddington and the Walton Files and stuff that isn't related to FNAF at all, like the Mandela Catalog and Gemini Home Entertainment, and Local 58 was like the one that started it all, and that I don't think was based on FNAF at all. So it's expanded quite a bit, but it has some roots in FNAF. Oh yeah, I said we talk about Security Breach, right? We've come a long way since the start of this video, haven't we? I mean, it started completely insane, and it's gotten completely insane, it's all completely insane, but, you know, for all of it, I still love this series. FNAF. I mean, not Garden of Ban Man, or Hello Neighbor, or Bending the Egg Machine. Those seem all varying degrees of alright, but this series I quite like. And leading up to the newest game, Security Breach, it was the longest we've ever had to wait for a game in the mainline series, and we were all really looking forward to it. It was taking quite a while, and some people were concerned because we weren't really getting many teasers or trailers. It was all fairly empty, and we didn't know what was going on. And so the wait started to become more anxiety-inducing. Maybe the game's gonna be way bigger than we think, or maybe things are just going poorly. And of course, the game did come out, and, and Scott explained to us beforehand that, you know, when you're baking a cake, sometimes the cake takes a bit longer than you might have thought, and it needs a bit more time in the oven. And then, um, he assured us that it was going to be very worth it in the end. <laughs> so I may have been a bit misleading. Um, turns out when you're making a cake, you don't want to just keep adding to it, or you might end up with something way bigger than you can handle, and then you can't bake it properly, or it doesn't even fit in the oven. And this cake metaphor doesn't really work very well, but you know what? It, it illustrates my point exactly. Security Breach got way too big, and it just kind of flopped a bit. Now, Steel Wool have gotten way too much criticism for this game, and I think it's it's unfair. They were really ambitious, they wanted to make something big, and they made, made it a bit too big, but massive amounts of hate they've been getting, I think, are a bit overblown. And Security Breach is in a perfectly playable state now, thanks to the hard work of the team behind it. But this game brought people in the fanbase to a breaking point. A lot of people left the series after this game because it just was too much. And yes, at the same time, a lot of people came back to the series because of this game because it was huge and realized there was a lot they missed out on. Like the spring trap pregnancy thing. Some people thought the game was terrible and some people thought it was alright and these arguments have continued for over a year after the release of the game. But it still did pretty well. I mean, considering how little the game was marketed, it did alright. And I think about the people who just showed up to the series and to the fanbase and just they, they arrived and saw everyone fighting about the latest game, like, I can't imagine how that would have looked. Now it's been over a year since the release of the game, and things have mostly calmed down, and once again, after seven years now, I'm still here. Sometimes it feels like I always have been. I've, I've watched this series go through some absolutely insane times. And looking back at it, funnily enough, most have been in the past three years. That's when the most ridiculous stuff happens. When Security Breach released, it's when a lot of the books came out, and all the other crazy stuff. The movie's happening now, for Pete's sake. Yet, I haven't left the series yet. In fact, I'm probably more invested in it than ever. With the big recent project I made recently, those FNAF dubs that were huge and everyone seemed to like, and now they want me to do more, a fully dubbed and orchestrated cinematic version of each FNAF book in the original trilogy. I'd actually tried to make it once before, but my channel just wasn't big enough. Those dubs also reminded me what I love about the series. The stories being told here are convoluted and messy and confusing, but man are they fun. Scott's managed to take a pretty bare-bones spooky plot and turn it into this huge empire. That's really impressive, and I don't care if parts of the story are absurd, like children being turned into pizzas. I like this series. These days, these games and books don't scare me anymore, but I still enjoy them because they're so absurd. And, man, it's been a wild ride making so many videos about them as well. It's funny, it it almost seems like I'm saying goodbye to something, even though I'm, I'm not. I'm still here. Right? Well, to tell you the truth, I, I might be. I don't mean that I'm quitting YouTube. I don't think I'll be able to do that for a long time. The addiction just runs way too deep, and I also don't mean I'm done making FNAF videos or enjoying this series. At least, not quite. But, man, looking at what I want to do for the future of this channel, all I can think about lately is the fact that there's so many other videos that I want to make, and not all of them are FNAF related. Many of them aren't. And maybe someday soon I, I will make my last FNAF video. It might happen. Whether that's a month from now, or several years from now. And the views might plummet, so that wouldn't be fun. I would prefer if they didn't, but I'm kind of anticipating that people won't watch my videos as much, and I'm honestly not too afraid. I like making videos because I like making things, and I think it'd be okay if some of you all stopped caring because 
I still will. I guess what I'm trying to get around to saying is, if you enjoyed this video, if you feel like it was a fun ride and you liked your time with me here, then in the coming months, when one day in the future I upload my last FNAF video with no fanfare and set off for New Horizons, I hope you're excited to see what that means. I think even if I talk about things that aren't as familiar for you, I'm going to try and make them interesting. I'm going to try and make them engaging to talk about. I have so many ideas already that I'm so excited to share, and I hope you guys come along with me. It won't be for a while yet, but it'll come. It's weird to say all that, though, because part of me feels like I'm still by that swing. Maybe just not the one sitting on it yet. Maybe now I'm the one who's not listening to a story, but I'm telling a story. A story that's crazy and insane and stupid and really fun, and I don't know if that's for sure. But I kind of want to find out, and I don't know how to do that. But maybe the best way is to just head back to that swing. Thank you so much for watching today's video all the way to the end, and to those of you who have waited two months to watch it, well, thank you even more. I realize it's been a long wait. Also, a special thanks to the channel patrons who help make these videos possible. Today, I'd like to thank in particular uh, SketchArts, Dogman83, Connor Stearman, and Evan... I, I just realized I've never said Evan's last name out loud. Agridano? Ag Agrida Agridano. Agrid Evan. If you would like your name in the credits of these videos as well, and to see videos before anyone else gets to, go to patreon.com slash elementiastudios. That's patreon.com slash elementiastudios. Thank you once again for watching. I'll see you all very soon.